I'll be back after the lecture for live Q&A with the speaker. If you'd like to submit a question, you may do so via the YouTube live chat box on your screen or via Twitter using at Insights NCL. And if you're tweeting about the event and want to share your thoughts, please use hashtag Insights NCL. I'm really pleased to introduce you to my friend and colleague, Dr. Christina Nisham. Christina is a reader in business ethics and corporate social responsibility and heads up our ethics, responsibility and sustainability working group here at Newcastle University Business School. She uses applied philosophy. That's philosophy that aims to make a real change in the world. To help us understand how we can collectively in society respond better to major challenges such as climate change. In light of the recent COP26 and the evidence there of just how difficult it is to get everyone to agree to make major changes, this talk is very timely. In this lecture, she will explore why it is so hard for business to really take on board the scale of change needed to address these challenges. As she and I often discuss, it is too simplistic to reduce this just to irresponsible business. The issues reach much wider into how the global economy works and how it encourages forms of reasoning that promote individual interests at the expense of societal ones. In her talk, Christina will unpack for us why this is so and start us thinking about what that means for how not only business, but also each of us needs to start thinking very differently about our responsibilities in the world. I hope you'll find the lecture interesting, thought provoking, and despite the rather doom laden nature of its subject matter, enjoyable. Thank you, Peter, for the generous introduction. Good evening, everyone and welcome to my discussion of global corporations in the context of climate change. Now we have all heard by now about anthropogenic climate change, that's the transformation of the planet's climate conditions due to humankind's activities such as industry, agriculture and transport. And this is now a widely acknowledged reality. All sides of human sociopolitics from extinction rebellion to COP26 see Glasgow 2021, conquer on this point. In his 2014 book, Reason in a Dark Time, environmental philosopher Dale Jameson asks whether we humans really have the ability to understand our responsibility for the destruction we're causing and concludes that anthropogenic climate change is not just the result of a failure in humans to act for the global good, but a failure of human morality itself to grasp the nature of the good needed to protect planet Earth and nurture a sustainable human habitat on it. Jameson's argument emphasizes the role of moral failure, understood in particular as a responsibility failure in the creation of anthropogenic climate change. Let me stop for a moment on this notion of moral failure and point out that it's not just about failing to do what is right or good, in this case for the natural environment. Lisa Tessman's book, also published in 2014 and entitled Moral Failure on the Impossible Demands of Morality, describes moral failure as arising in situations where realizing that I must do something that is right or good comes into conflict with realizing that I can't, I actually can't do that something for various reasons. I'd like to apply and extend this concept here in my lecture today to define a particular kind of systemic dysfunction or systemic failure in human society, which is neither a market failure nor a government failure as defined in economic studies, but a moral responsibility failure, pointing not to misallocation to resources with poor results for an economic or social system, but to incapacity to act from an appropriate sense of responsibility with poor results for maintaining life and especially human life on Earth. 
Since 2014, we've had the Paris Agreement and the suite of global events, geophysical, political and economic, that have propelled climate change issues to the forefront of the international community's agenda and have constrained most key social actors to make serious efforts like never before to agree on coordinated responses to maximize their effectiveness. So the United Nations Climate Change Conference in Glasgow earlier this month, the so-called COP26, which dominated the world news for over two weeks, is a clear example of those efforts. What we have seen at COP26 is that next to sovereign governments, global corporations are increasingly perceived as major social actors in responding to climate change challenges. And these corporations are now prepared like never before to publicly accept this role and propose concrete actions in this role. After decades of denial, the progress is promising. However, my previous and current research into barriers to corporate action to mitigate the risks of climate change suggests that this progress is not sufficient to generate action with significant results. And the main reason for this is that demonstrably global corporations find themselves in a situation of systemic failure, I argue. Of the type I know I must do, but in fact I can't do. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that the corporate representatives speaking at COP26 are lying to us. I believe they are genuinely willing to contribute to effective solutions. With this awareness and public acknowledgement of what must be done, to, for example, reduce uh, um, greenhouse gas emissions, to limit global temperature rise to, say, maximum 1.5 to 2 degrees by, by the end of this century. Now, it's only now that moral failure becomes apparent. So far, we have had failure in awareness of the nature and dimensions of the problem, but now, despite much better awareness, we need to be prepared that failure to act is still possible, and this should in fact become our most pressing concern. Failure to act is possible now because, as I argue here, the sources of the moral failures we should be concerned about are not accidental, that is, due to some individual behaviors that can be controlled and corrected. They are systemic. That's that means they're embedded in the structures of our social institutions, including those of global corporations. At first sight, it can be said that the blame is to be placed on corporate regulatory regimes, which don't invoke inadequate adequate levels of responsibility for global problems such as climate change. Serious efforts to find solutions in this debate seem to be invested in ways to improve the regulation of global corporations. And this review is no doubt necessary, but I don't think it's just a matter of making some legislative changes. Today, I propose that we look deeper into what makes global corporations fail to take enough responsibility for dealing with climate change. And I have chosen to speak about global corporations because these are the most comprehensive structures of coordinated economic activity humankind has been able to produce so far and their power and resources correspond most closely to the global level of the problem, at least at this stage. Okay. In this context, I'd like to speak about five major sources of responsibility failure. And these sources, I argue, are systemic and structural, as mentioned before. They are diffusion of responsibility, decoupling from natural systems, proliferation of negative externalities, transnationalization and deterritorialization. And together, they help to explain in more depth why global corporations, at least in their current structures and cultures, cannot be the leaders we need for guiding humanity towards a more sustainable future in the face of climate change. Let me start with diffusion of responsibility, which essentially refers to individual behaviors in groups. Social psychologists have observed that when deciding and acting in groups, people as individuals tend to assume some sort of strength in numbers and so they feel less personal responsibility for the group decision. Contrary to the popular opinion that more heads are better than one, when in agreement, the group is likely to make more risky, even extreme decisions than if the same individuals were to decide separately when considering themselves fully 100% responsible for the outcome. 
The effect I'd like to emphasize here is this dilution of individual responsibility, which becomes the more severe as the size and complexity of a group or organization increases. In a nutshell, it's like the human mind operates a kind of arithmetic division of responsibilities, which should work in theory, provided that each and every individual fully discharges their own part of the overall responsibility. But in practice, this doesn't happen. And it's not just because some people, for various reasons, may fail to meet their allocated responsibility. There's a deeper structural reason at play here, which has to do with our failure to understand the nature of complex systemic problems. When seeking to address this kind of problem, the full responsibility needed to do this effectively is not a simple sum of partial individual responsibilities, but an articulation and coordination of the interdependencies that exist between these partial responsibilities as a reflection of the interdependencies that characterize the aggregate phenomenon. In other words, our common sense of individual responsibility is already too limited to account for large scale compound effects of individual human behaviors. So let me illustrate my point with some examples. Let's look at some individual behaviors together. In these pictures, you see someone may throw litter on the street pavement or forget to buy their public transport ticket or trade in complex financial products such as collateral debt obligations without taking into account their real value or regularly drive a car that releases greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. While many of us may not engage in these first three behaviors, we can safely say that most of us are actually engaging in the fourth behavior. So the point I'm going to make here in relation to the climate change problem is in fact very personal for most people, at least in some regions of the globe. So we don't need rocket science to help us predict what will happen if a large critical number of people on Earth behave in the same way. But in these four cases, we don't just have predictions. We also have evidence of disastrous aggregate effects that have already occurred. Uncontrollably throwing litter everywhere has filled our land and water with an inordinate amount of waste, most non-biodegradable, but this is another story in itself. Then generalized fair evasion leads to the disruption and in the longer term erosion of public transport services as citizens in Victoria, South Australia and New York City, for instance, have had to experience at times. Widespread trade in overvalued financial products has led to the global financial crisis, bringing many economies around the world, not just the US and other OECD countries, to their knees. And people drive an estimated 1.4 billion cars for personal use on a daily basis. According to the latest studies, passenger cars represent 44% of GHG emissions from transport activities, and transport is the second largest source of greenhouse gas emissions, about 15% after energy production, which is about 30%. So this is what complex systemic problems look like. Why I'm saying that our common sense individual responsibility is actually not enough in these cases. First, what do we mean by common sense individual responsibility? Well, it's the level of responsibility that people like you and I tend to assume in everyday situations. And it can be summed up in the following statement. Each individual is responsible for the consequences of their own actions. Now, if we interpret this statement as a rule or principle that guides our everyday behavior, we can argue that um, if it, it fits well with our common sense of justice. For example, um, it would be too much to expect someone to be responsible for something they themselves haven't done. And this is why the principle you see here is fundamental to the vast majority of our contemporary legal systems. But this same principle is inherently inadequate in tackling large-scale systemic problems. And this is why. 
Imagine you're asked to press a button and you know that if you do this, a piece of wire connecting the button with the finger of another person will send an almost imperceptible electric impulse to that person. But then imagine that you have thousands of buttons and we don't need too many, all connected to the same person and thousands of different people pressing their buttons at the same time. The effect is predictable, isn't it? Um, well, here is the paradox. Someone has just been electrocuted and killed, but according to the principle of individual responsibility I have mentioned, no one is responsible for this tragic outcome because caring only about the consequences of each individual action, considered independently of all other actions, would mean claiming only a negligible effect from each individual, right? Well, I have used this made up scenario to describe something else, something that has already happened. And this is the global financial crisis. Inquiries in the US Congress and the UK Parliament on its effects and causes in 2010 have revealed the full limitations of the legal perspective and this has been labeled by scholars as the exemption view. This view contends that individuals in the role of managers of financial institutions engaging in extensive trade of high risk financial products have neither the obligation to reflect on the social effects of their actions from a moral point of view, nor an obligation to act in accordance with that. So the, the legal defense test question supporting this position is, would this individual not engaging in this particular act have made a difference to the overall or final outcome? Well, while this sort of judgment makes sense at some limited individual level, it's at the core of the systemic problem we're facing. And it results directly from an understanding of individual responsibility as something something that happens in a vacuum, independently of the actions of any other market players. But in the context of relating individual actions to large scale systemic outcomes, the legal test question from the exemption view does not make any sense. Think about playing Jenga. For those of you who may not be familiar with this game, it involves two or more players removing in turns one block at a time from a compact tower of usually 54 wooden blocks stacked on top of each other in rows of three. Each block removed from the original structure is then placed on top to create another level or, or row. So as the structure becomes less and less stable, it eventually reaches a tipping point where the whole structure collapses. The last player to move a block before the tower collapses is the so-called loser. Now, in practice, this is exactly what happened with the last players on the market for CDOs um, in the global financial crisis, such as Lehman Brothers. Uh, you would have seen movies like The Big Short or Margin Call. Um, but applying the legal exemption view gives inconsistent results. It's, it's useful when it recognizes that the collapse of the entire structure can't be attributed entirely to the last move, but not so useful when it treats each and every move as having a minor contribution to the overall outcome. Here, individual responsibility is so diluted that it becomes insignificant. This narrow understanding of responsibility is a weak basis for building adequate responses to complex um, problems in organizations. And diffusion of responsibility in group decisions makes things worse. Surprisingly, they can get much worse precisely in larger, more powerful organizations and precisely the ones we may be tempted to invest more hope in. For example, if we compare an informal group of consumers, say shoppers in your neighborhood, with the formally structured groups in a global corporation, we can observe that diffusion of responsibility has more scope to occur in the global corporation. There are important factors contributing to it. For instance, global corporations function based on structures that are mobilized to give authority to and protect and support their boardroom decisions, including uh, legally at all times. 
And this factor by itself can often be enough to give boardroom decision-making processes a kind of impersonal aura, um, as well as strong legitimacy, sheltering them from critique and contestation. So the second moral failure I will talk about today is caused by decoupling from natural systems. With the building of human civilizations beyond the hunter-gatherer condition, human beings have built for themselves a habitat they would like to regard as self-contained, sheltered from the whims of nature, so to speak. And the price of that is a loss of personal, emotional and spiritual connection with nature and resulting from it a loss of care for nature. To take responsibility, we need to first notice and become aware and then understand the importance of what we see and then feel that we care. Deep ecology studies illustrate this lack of responsibility in detail. So as a sub part of this trend, our economic production systems have decoupled from natural ecosystems in ways that have prevented us for millennia from seeing and therefore understanding the consequences of our actions on the natural environment beyond the, the boundaries of our own local communities. We're still suffering from this impairment today, despite the fact that the global systemic problems we have created are now increasingly stacking their effects at our door in our plain view. Now, moral intensity research shows that for us as individuals to experience responsibility for consequences as an emotion rather than a rational conclusion, we need the outcome to be highly probable, close to us physically in space, immediate in time, with concentrated and concrete impacts and arousing a similar emotion and concern in other people, usually in our neighbors. This seems to explain quite well why, despite repeated alarm signals launched by the international scientific community about global warming for the last 50 years or more, the core issues have not triggered any major moral intensity in, um, in large coordinated efforts. So we are now reacting to these issues with much more concern than previously, precisely because the outcomes are beginning to meet those conditions that bring them to our view. We see extreme weather events occurring more often anywhere in the world and incremental changes generalize and cause sudden events of extreme local severity, sea ice cap melting and rise of ocean levels. And as individuals, we humans socialize and coordinate into larger organized systems precisely in order to expand our individual perceptions, sensibilities and understandings. So that as a community, we should be able to see, feel and understand more than we otherwise could individually. I return to global corporations as potential candidates for helping us achieve a global level of human seeing, feeling and understanding. And I'm prepared to read their willingness to participate in COP26 and similar debates in this key. So I have examined the potential of global corporations for fulfilling this role. And I have found, looking beyond public statements, that most of their behaviors in fact reinforce and magnify our individual limits rather than expanding our capabilities so that we could develop more adequate levels of responsibility for climate change as a global systemic problem. Our recent history of social debate around climate change covers several decades of contesting the existence of anthropogenic climate change with global corporations, especially those in the fossil fuel energy based industries at the forefront of most anti consensus efforts. My project here is to find deeper explanations about why global corporations are more likely to adopt perspectives that distort how close in space and time and how severe climate change impacts are, instead of perspectives that model how we should care about impacts that appear distant from us in space, time and intensity. I offer the following three responsibility failures specific to corporations as potential contributions to these explanations. 
The third responsibility failure I'll talk about today is specific to free enterprises operating in free markets. It's the externalization of certain production costs to the wider society in various forms. And these are essentially costs generated by the activities of a business, but not paid for by that business. This results in negative impacts on other parts of society and on the natural environment. Externalities can range anywhere from occupational hazards and consumer injury to environmental pollution and degradation. And while many of these externalities can, at least in theory, be addressed through the existing legal systems, a planetary scale type of externality such as global warming has no such coverage, not even in principle. One reason for this lies in the fragmented legal jurisdictions across the globe. But looking at the global corporations as the most expensive coordinated structures we have, we note at least two important structural barriers. First is the well-known shareholder primacy assumption, which allows corporate executives to interpret their fiduciary duty as directed at maximizing the value of the financial investments made in the corporation by direct contributors and to consider those at the expense of everyone else's interests in the corporation. Um, shareholder primacy not only allows managers of corporations to impose negative externalities on society, but may even create an obligation on managers to do so at every opportunity, as John Boatwright explains. I'm not going to engage in a complex demonstration here, but I'll say that there are ways to interpret the law differently, to do justice to a wide range of stakeholders' interests, including the natural environment. Um, Lynn Stout, for example, provides viable interpretation uh, of the law, in my view, in her book about shareholder value myth. And this was published in 2012. But it's the second barrier that, in combination with the first, makes it practically impossible for corporations of any kind to assume responsibility for global systemic problems such as climate change. And this is the principle of limited liability. Legally incorporated company structures are defined by this principle, which rules that investors in incorporated ventures, including shareholders, can only be made liable for costs up to a fixed amount, usually the value of their invested funds or shares. But as other studies have pointed out, such as Jelic and Botello in 2013, limited liability is a powerful structural source of moral hazard. According to risk managers, moral hazard is a door left wide open for those who wish to exploit opportunities to gain private benefits because now they can easily pass on any costs to other members of society without being held liable in any way for doing so. What's striking about the moral hazard inducing character of limited liability is the extent to which it breaches our current most basic common sense principle of responsibility. Presumably our legal system should be expected to address complexities beyond common sense, therefore to enhance our existing sense of responsibility further rather than diminish it. At law, each one of us as citizens and members of our communities are responsible for the consequences of our actions without conditions that limit this responsibility before we know what these consequences may be. So how is it possible to accept that corporations should exercise in principle less responsibility than the rest of us? Research shows that moral hazard is more likely to occur in relation to complex, highly interdependent phenomena with latent effects, where the causes are unclear and the effects are not visible to the agent or not present in their mind at the time of the action is, uh, when the action is taken. This suggests that confronted by global systemic problems, corporations are more likely to be impaired in their decisions and actions by short-termist thinking and to act as conduits for proliferating this rent-seeking behaviors rather than providing longer-term perspectives and leadership. Far from protecting investors from risk, as it may have been originally intended for, Limited liability actually encourages risk-seeking behavior beyond ordinary limits, 
And in the context of the global financial crisis, for example, this explains both how the crisis emerged and why the financial corporations themselves are unable to fix it. At individual level, the lesson is that our sense of responsibility, as much as we're capable of, remains active only if we're exposed to and confronted with the consequences of our actions. If we're sheltered from those consequences, then our sense of responsibility also declines and even fails, fails us altogether. In the context of global warming, in the extractive and energy in industry, for instance, moral hazard is so generalized that the exploitive dimensions of such activities, such as short-term profit for a few at the expense of the rest of society, has become normal. So, now to further limits, specific to global corporations. It's rather bizarre and gives me an eerie feeling to realize that instead of expanding human capabilities as they reasonably should, these giants of organization and coordination are in fact reducing our sense of responsibility even further. Two relatively recent trends in economic and corporate globalization illustrate my point here. First, transnationalization. A transnational corporation, or TNC for short, is a corporation that undertakes foreign direct investment, owns or controls income gathering assets in more than one country, produces goods or services outside of its country of origin, or engages in international production. According to Biersteke, this is a definition back in the 1970s. Now, this, while this is not a new trend, Transnationalization has recently become a global phenomenon, and this means not only that transnational corporations have become widespread, but also that their proliferation has become systematic. In other words, transnationalization is inherent in the current development course of the global economy. Today, an increasing number of TNCs are becoming wealthier than most nation states, but although they are major global actors, these organizations are not held accountable to a level that matches their economic, cultural, and political impacts on society. Routinely, TNCs elude accountability to nation states using income redistribution tactic, tactics and taking advantage of weak national governments or inadequate legal systems that are ill-prepared for the new levels of responsibility needed especially for addressing systemic global problems such as climate change. In her study of the modern emergence of TNCs, back in 2000, Henderson finds that the same wars between private and public interests that characterized corporate jurisprudence disputes within national legal systems prior to 2000 are now being played out at global level. This shows that globalization has not really improved on the moral failures that already existed in the so-called affluent nations, but only extended and generalized their reach and impacts in other parts of the world as well. As a result, under the cultural influence of TNCs, our sense of responsibility for the environment, instead of being improved, seems to be further impaired and as we tend to lose we, we tend to lose valuable cultural capabilities that local communities previously had to relate harmoniously with their natural in, environment evidence collected as early as the 1990s shows that when confronted with pressures to increase their social responsibilities TNCs have been inclined to engage their power and resources to fight back and resist such pressures, even if a regulation would benefit them by organizing a new and larger market or help capitalize a cleaner cost saving technology, they would still do it. And this systematic anti-social responsibility behavior of TNCs has become one of the most serious obstacles to a global transition to production and consumption practices that are ecologically sustainable. By refusing to shift their resources so that investments in green and non-fossil fuel based technologies becomes dominant, 
TMCs deprive consumers from appropriate options to adopt behaviors that reduce their carbon footprint to significant levels. And this scenario presents an institutionalized self-reinforcing pattern of production consumption that appears extremely difficult, if not impossible to change. However, evidence collected over the same period also shows that when a critical number of external, economic, social and political forces coagulate, come together to favor pro-ecological behaviors, for example, to set new environmental standards, that global producers have to comply with, those global producers tend to abandon overt resistance strategies instead, and they will struggle for a seat at the standard setting table where they would influence the, the outcome. And more often than not, the effects of their interventions are conservative. And this process is known as standards capturing. So when TNCs act to lower global environmental standards, the most common argument used is that market liberalization, deregulation or privatization are more efficient and nationally competitive than the alternatives. But the evidence to support this view is rather weak, especially when adopting a systemic global and longer term perspective. Instead, there's compelling evidence that TNCs are massive mechanisms that privatize benefits while massively externalizing social and environmental costs. This, these costs may be invisible because they're not measured or accounted for by anyone, not even by the national governments of the affected countries. But what about the people who run the TNCs? Are they human? Are they moral agents with a sense of responsibility? Well, these people can be regarded as having a privileged position as they can see and understand from global reports, the global level impacts caused by their decisions and actions. And yet what we see in TNCs is more barriers to developing a sense of responsibility rather than less. It's not just that increasing the number of reporting layers in the organizational hierarchy causes more distance between, say, top management and lower rank, rank employees confronted with some of the effects of the top decisions. This, this we also have to, to, to add to this, we have to add the psychological distance between transnational headquarters and national branches which adds new barriers to our understanding and care for anthropogenic climate change. And the fifth source of moral failure is deterritorialization, closely associated with transnationalization. It has usually an extra uh, dimension, which is technological. This happens when a community of people traditionally united by specific cultural practices becomes separated from a particular physical geographic location. A whole range of relatively new occupations from call center operators to high tech consultants and developers see the virtual management of e-commerce operations at Uber, for example. They work according to some global norms that instead of drawing them closer to the defined cultures of their customers, or other stakeholders actually distance them from those. Deterritorialization is a distinctive cultural feature of contemporary globalization, and global corporations play a crucial role in generalizing this phenomenon. Global consumption of products and services, but also information via global media, has led to a proliferation of deterritorialized communities and cultures. Global corporations themselves produce this deterritorializing effect in their own expatriate employees. And for the individuals leading these corporations as moral agents, this can add to the already existing moral failures because lack or loss of affiliation with a particular territory tends to prevent them from understanding or feeling responsible and caring for the people and ecosystems in those various territories and for the physical geographic condition of our planet itself. 
So to conclude, the extent of change we wish to see in global corporations, the trust that they can actually deliver on promises such as those made at COP26 is, is enormous. I, I, I will address these expectations in reverse order. So first, in response to responsibility failures caused by deterritorialization and transnationalization, global corporations should agree and act to pay the costs of their impacts on host territories and even more to create measurable value for the host countries. Second, in response to responsibility failures caused by limited liability more generally, Global corporations should adopt new norms for internalizing, reducing, and eventually eliminating negative externalities that have a global impact on the natural environment. These norms should begin with the effective implementation of a do-no-harm principle. Third, in response to responsibility failures caused by decoupling from nature, Global corporations should invest significant resources in actively supporting sustainable human habitats that co-evolve in harmony with their natural ecosystem. And fourth, as an antidote to the structural barriers caused by diffusion of responsibility, global corporations, especially those that produce and consume fossil fuel-based energy, should not only accept comprehensive co-responsibility for anthropogenic climate change, but also coordinate strategies to exercise that responsibility through effective actions. And this would be the key test of global corporations' capacity for leadership in addressing the unprecedented climate change challenges we're all facing. I argue that if and when global corporations fulfill these four requirements, then we can trust that they will be able to deliver on what they are promising today. And so I will stop here and invite questions. Thank you. Well, Christina, thank you very much for what's been a, a very interesting and thought-provoking talk. Um, if you have questions about Christina's talk, there are details about how to submit them uh, on the YouTube video at the moment. Uh, we have got a couple of questions in already, Christina. So uh, we've got one from Jennifer who's asking, in your view, was COP26 a success? Uh, thank you, Peter, and thank you, Jennifer, for the question. Um, I'm happy to be here, and it is indeed a, a, a tricky question. Um, was it a success? Um, in some sense, it was. Uh, we need to recognize that uh, awareness at international level is unprecedented, that there has been a general willingness to uh, participate and contribute to the debate and acknowledge the seriousness of the climate change problem. So in that sense, COP26, I think, is particularly um, distinctive, if you like, as an event from the previous COPs and the previous um, um, events, uh, conferences, international conferences that were trying to drum up interest in, in the subject. Uh, so we are really over the hump here. But uh, I think what is happening also is we need to acknowledge that it is not enough to um, throw an inordinate amount of money to, uh, to the problem. We have heard about pledges 
that are also unprecedented, you know, trillions of dollars. Um, uh, recently, Mark Carney has suggested that this will be uh, invested in addressing the climate change problem. And again, it's nice to hear about the uh, amounts of resources that are being put in, but uh, really the focus, the concern should go on to what exactly needs to be done about this and what everybody's or each and um, every, um, let's say, corporation's part in this um, concerted effort should be. Um, and here is where we need to continue the debate and have clear answers because COP26 is not providing, has not provided that yet. Well, on that topic of, of money, uh, Katie is asking, do you think uh, green taxes might be the answer? Yes, so I, 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 I am a bit uh, <laughs> always um, cautious about saying what the answer should be. Uh, given it's a complex problem, obviously, we're not going to have just one answer. Um, it's probably a small part. It can be a small part of the answer. Um, and again, the context in which green taxes could be implemented is a very important one uh, because you can have uh, green taxes implemented with um, uh, little in, in, let's say, fragmented parts of the world with little support elsewhere. And that is not going to be enough. But if we generalize, uh, also, uh, green taxes will have to be complemented by other measures. Um, uh, and this is where the debate really is. Uh, so it could be part of the answer. So perhaps just sort of picking up on this issue of the debate and the rareness of the debate then. Uh, Sam is asking, um, what do you think about the way that climate change is generally reported in the media? Well, um, climate change is reported in so many different ways. Um, I guess one good thing about it is uh, because it's so constantly present this, uh, as a topic, despite the perspectives on it, um, it has clearly increased everybody's awareness. Um, but I think also what we need to be concerned about now is the, the fragmentation of these views and the fact that um, we do need to channel our efforts into action and action needs coordination and it needs some kind of integration of these views. And I'm not being, um, I'm not advocating um, uh, unification of views in some sort of common I dominant ideology. What I'm um, uh, uh, advocating is is that that these views and these reports need to actually support um, coordinated efforts to address the problem, and I'm not seeing that yet. Okay, and uh, we've got another question here, which I think is picking up with something that you said at the beginning of the lecture about uh, how. Uh, the moral argument is uh, supplementary to, uh, in addition to issues around market and, and government. And um, the, the question really here is, you know, is, isn't it really actually the fact that politics is actually what really counts here? And this is more important than issues around how we understand moral risk and responsibility. Yes, I, I always wonder about uh, when we talk about politics, what it is that we actually mean by it. Is it, um, is it simply uh, about alerting us to the fact that there are power differentials and people are going to use power in their own interests whenever they have it uh, and whenever they have one over others? Um, is that what politics means or do we have a more expansive view of politics whereby um, you use power in the interest of a broader community. You know, uh, at the end of the day, public affairs are also run by politics, and it could be a very uh, responsible and widely responsible politician rather than just a, a venal, um, you know, pursuer of private interests. So, so okay. in, in that context, um, I'm, I'm a bit confused about what to do with. Um, the suggestion that that politics is very important here. It, I mean, of course, it is important. What kind of politics do we want to promote, though? So, turning to to another issue, which is um, 
very politically sensitive at the least, um, developing countries and how do they uh, overcome the financial challenge that they have here that in many cases they're very dependent on natural resources for income and this forces them into a certain relationship in the global economy which can be difficult for them to get to to move green from yeah yeah it's it's a serious problem and it is a, a systemic problem because uh, um, i think that the problem starts from if you look at from the perspective of the powerful global corporations the ones that are actually at the at the center of of um uh, constraining the developing countries into giving away, well, giving away, uh, uh, selling their natural resources in order to survive a globalized economy. Um, the issue here is if you want, if we want a systemically responsible result, then it should start with global corporations realizing that there needs to be a juster distribution of these financial resources. Yeah. So, for example, we mentioned COP26 and we mentioned the, the amount of money that was pledged for addressing the climate change problem. The question, one part of the question is, where is this going, this, this amount of money going to be distributed? Who is going to benefit from those resources? And, and maybe instead of um, requiring or constraining developing countries with natural resources to use the resources in order to feed the, the, the same uh, polluting global economy machine. Uh, there should be support for preserving these natural resources for the benefit of the countries that have them, but also for the benefit of the whole world. Uh, think about the Amazon and how the Amazon is the lung of uh, the, the, the whole planetary atmosphere. The Amazon doesn't just belong to Brazil or, or countries uh, around uh, in South America. It belongs to the whole planet, to all of us. We should all be responsible for it and we should all pay for it, uh, I guess, would be would be the moral point here. So you, you mentioned briefly in there um, about how corporations respond to this and uh, the, the purpose of corporations. And Paul is asking what you think of... Uh, B Corps, B Corporations, the businesses which are aiming to, to balance profit with uh, high standards of social and environmental performance as, as their purpose? I think they're very good news. The fact that we have a legal uh, status uh, for a different type of organization that can prioritize these more larger social and environmental objectives uh, is a very important development. And we would know, I would use this as an indicator, if we can see B Corps proliferating around the world, then that is a good sign that we as, as humankind, as society, have reached a level of awareness so that now we can organize ourselves in a more meaningful and systemic way to take responsibility for the planet. And I, I think that that would be a, a, a very uh, important trend. Um, I, I hope it's going to happen. I hope B Corps are going to become, uh, the ideal would be for them to become the dominant corporation, uh, if, uh, if I may. And what about taking responsibility for what we've already done to the planet? So Jeremy particularly is asking, what about this issue about whether we should be um, providing compensation to poorer countries for the damage that has already been caused by climate change to them by the lifestyles of the more affluent countries? I, I think that is an argument that has, that has uh, merit um, because when you look at natural sustainability conditions, they are actually inversely proportional with economic affluence. Um, the most affluent societies are actually the most environmentally destructive. And the only reason why we still can keep together in the, on this planet is because over 80% of the world's economies are actually doing something else. Uh, they're doing needs economies, they're doing survival, and they're doing that they're, they're actually um, um, more um, kinder to their environments, so to speak. So in a sense, 
uh, when we're losing the, the quality of the planetary environment, it's, it's largely due to the, to the industrialized economies. So in a, in a sense, that is, uh, there, there is, they are more responsible for what has happened. And that's another reason why you're looking to the past for compensation is similar to looking to the future for a better, juster, more balanced society. And that would mean in both directions, um, providing poorer countries with the resources they need to, to, to maintain this balance. Yeah. So, so just as our final question, we have one here from Robert Rich, perhaps is sort of it wraps all of these up and encompasses, encompasses them, is, is asking you, what would it take to actually achieve the sorts of behavioral change that we need in order to slow down climate change? And is this really possible? Or are we simply asking too much of society and business? Well, we may get to the point where um, it wouldn't be too much to ask simply because it would be vital to ask. Uh, and, and when we plan for addressing climate change, we should think that we need these transitions from this polluting uh, type of economies that we're practicing at the moment to something that is environmentally sustainable as soon as possible. And there's a whole stream of research that has been channeled in the last couple of decades at least on sustainability transitions. Um, looking at precisely practical ways of doing this uh, transformation, this transition from where we are at with our economy, global economy now, and where we should be in order to um, induce the behavior change needed to slow climate change. So efforts are being made to work this out. And what we see in, these, in this research is that it is a very complex task. Is it daunting? Yes, it is. But is it necessary? Yes, it is vital. So like any, any problem, <laughs> we need to, 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 to tackle it head on. Well, thank you very much, Christine. I'm afraid that's all we have time for. Um, it's been a fascinating talk and uh, discussion. Um, thank you also to our audience for watching. I hope you found it interesting. Uh, and I'll just sign off by saying that our next event is going to be on Thursday this week, the 25th of November, on new voices on arts, humanities and social sciences. So we hope you will join us next time for that talk. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>